Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back from lunch. I hope you all had a lot to eat um, because we have some two sessions left and they are very, very, very interesting. Now, we move on to the session entitled Peace and Governance and we ask what's at stake here. I would like to introduce, first of all, our moderator for this session, Shelley Inglis. She is the UNDP Regional Governance and Peace Building Leader. Round of applause. <laughs> we're doing this in a different style to our previous panels, as for those of you who were here earlier. Um, now, our panelists, Goran, identify yourself. There you are. Goran Zvilanovic, Secretary General, Regional Cooperation Council for Southeast Europe. Welcome. And then we have Vasilika Hisse. She's the Deputy Parliament Speaker in Albania. Welcome to you. And then we have next, we have Laura Vidovic, Ombudswoman from Croatia. Welcome, Hosh Galbaniz. And then next, Per Saxegard, who is the Executive Chairman of the Business for Peace Foundation. Welcome to you, and welcome to you all. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much. So we are on the 5P called Peace. How does the SDG agenda contribute to the ultimate goal of peace. And as many of you may know, the new Secretary General uh, has come out with a very strong agenda on something called sustaining peace, which is about ensuring the prevention of conflict, the prevention of societal breakdown, strengthening the social contract. And he has said the best way to prevent conflict is actually to implement the SDG agenda. But there are dimensions of the SDG agenda that are particularly conducive to sustaining peace, to preventing uh, societal breakdown and preventing conflict. And one of them is called SDG 16, one of the newest dimensions of the development agenda. SDG 16 includes a range of targets around strengthening governance, strengthening the rule of law, ensuring access to justice, providing effective, uh, responsive, accountable institutions, ensuring participation in decision-making and representative decision-making, addressing corruption, uh, organized crime, trafficking of firearms, all of these dimensions, and dimensions and other goals, such as SDG 5, with, which looks at gender equality, have a direct line and a direct um, impact on efforts to prevent conflict, to ensure strong uh, social contracts, and to ensure sustainable development outcomes across the board. So that's the framing for our panel today, and we have a fantastic panel that represents a range of actors. As you know, this overall conference is about partnerships and engaging a broad range of institutions and actors in the partnership for implementation of the SDGs, and we have uh, a representation here of a range of actors. This panel will focus particularly in terms of our region on the challenges we face with sustaining peace and implementing the SDGs, particularly SDG 16 in the Western Balkans, which still 25 years since the conflict um, has challenges in ensuring uh, peace is sustained and in uh, implementing uh, key reforms, institutional reforms, and the rule of law. So with that, let me start by asking Goran, who is the uh, Secretary General of the RCC, the coordination um, mechanism for all of the countries in Southeast Europe, to reflect a little bit on, on these challenges and on sustaining peace in the Western Balkans today. Goran. Thank you very much to you, Shelley, to you, also to Rasta, to Chihan, to the whole group of yours working hard in UNDP. I'm very much grateful for the invitation and I'm also grateful for the cooperation we have developed with the RCC. Today, I came actually, uh, I'm on a mission. I'd like to shake you guys and would like to tell you a story. Jasna is uh, Bosnian. 
She's living in Sarajevo. She's 42 years old. Uh, when there was a war, she escaped, spent some time in Germany, therefore fluent German. Uh, she earns today 2,000 euros a month in Sarajevo, which is as much as her minister. She gave birth only very late, recently. Uh, therefore, she has a baby boy who is two years old. Uh, she is about to leave. She has made up her mind to leave the country. And I talked to her. Come on, I said, look, why? Why would you leave? She's not a usual suspect. She's not poor. Neither a poor nor a student who would leave and then stay. She should be the one leading this society. By education, by her ages. She should be running for office in her early 40s. She said, look, I'm fed up with all of you guys politicians. She's not politically partisan. She doesn't give a damn who's who. She simply says, I'm fed up. I am better than this country. I trusted you, Goran, after the Dayton Peace Accord. And 20 years later, then I was 20 or so, 20 years later, this is my country? This is what you call peace? No. I will not let my newborn live in this country as I want. Better education, better health system, better judiciary, the one I trust in. I don't trust this society. Then 20 years from now, when my newborn is going to be in a situation to make his own decisions to still be in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Actually, I'm saying all of this to tell you it's a huge problem. We are faced in Serbia, you are faced in Albania. Statistics that we have, it is a Balkan barometer, it's all on our website of the rcc.int of the Regional Cooperation Council. We do the survey. Is that 44% of Bosnia and Herzegovina citizens are considering living. 48% of Kosovars, every second. And take into consideration that we are all society, Serbia, Montenegro, Bosnia, Herzegovina, we, we don't have that many youth. So if you have one third or more, you do have Jasna in the statistics. Those who are 40 and are living. She has enough of a social contact abroad and enough of money, she's going to get out. It ain't going to be a problem for her. But it is going to be a problem for the society. She is abandoning. Who is going to run this country tomorrow? What kind of education? What age? Who are going to be these politicians tomorrow if Jasna is to leave Bosnia and Herzegovina? And it's not very much better picture, believe me, in any of our countries. So if you dig deep, what I'm telling you eventually, and why I actually applaud to the work of UNDP and the SDGs as defined by the UNSG. It's not only about development. It's not only about poverty. It is much bigger. It's about the decency in society. And decency means a trust in the institutions, trust in the judiciary. Do you know what the people in Bosnia and Herzegovina say when they are asked about corruption? I have some figures here. They would say 79% of them say that the government is not fighting corruption efficiently. Well, ask about the judiciary, the figures are awful. In the Western Balkans, on average, 70% of them say that they do not believe that the justice is served equally. And 80 plus are saying that they believe the judiciary is driven by politicians. With this level of trust, you don't want to live in a country. You hate the country you live in, though you are not the poorest. I'm not challenging her patriotism. I wouldn't dare ever. 
But I'm coming back to an understanding, and I there would like to say that what the EU is doing with our countries in the accession process now, insisting on the rule of law is actually, a, I'd say, right attitude. It is about rule of law. It is about the deep reforms that we are yet to do. And there I think we should bond together what you do in the UNDP and in the other UN agencies, as only this might be a way out from the situation we are in. I'm sorry if I've spoiled your lunch, but it is that bad. In spite of every effort done in the Balkans, I'm challenging the understanding of peace in the region 20 years after the wars, if people are about to leave. I'm challenging the reform processes we have done. I was in the government for four years. 20 years after the war. I'm challenging the vitality of the institutions that should be part of our life and therefore make us happy in the societies. We love the Balkans, we love the food, we just enjoyed. We love the parties. But eventually, the future of her child, she doesn't see in the context of partying, food, but in the context of decent society she can trust in. Here, I'd like to invite you guys. Let's talk about Yasna. Thanks, Goran. A great opening and framing for the discussion today. Maybe Laura, who is both chairperson of the Ombuds Institution, but also the chairwoman of the um, European Network for National Human Rights Institutions, Maybe you could reflect further on, on Goran's insights and the role of national human rights institutions. Yes, thank you. Well, I'll thank UNDP later for, for providing this wonderful opportunity for all of us to meet and discuss these very important issues. Um, just jumping straight into Goran's argument, I agree with almost everything you said. And you paint, painted pretty gloom and pessimistic picture. And I'd say, uh, many of the information and the data you shared, basically all of the problems you mentioned, are all those that could be said also about Croatia, and no wonders, it's the same geography and, and the challenges are more or less the same. But the question that I would ask then is what do we do about it? How do we change that situation? How, how do we help ourselves to see the glass half full and not half empty? And who has the responsibility to change this situation. And I mean, the answer obviously to the responsibility question is very simple. We all have the responsibility, the governments, the parliamentarians, the civil society, of course, the national human rights institutions, such as the, such as the institution that I lead. So the main question for me is how do we use the SDGs, the goals, the indicators, and the human rights agenda that go hand in hand to change this situation, to tackle the causes of this despair and dissatisfaction that you talk about, that is the groundwork for the conflict, to learn something from it and to prevent it. If history has taught us anything, I guess, particularly in the Western Balkans region, but I guess other, uh, elsewhere as well, is if the human rights violation go unaddressed and the perpetrators go unpunished, then that leads to conflict that then has further human rights violations. When it comes to the SDGs, National Human Rights Institution, I mean, of course, the goal 16 is so important because it's the foundation of all other SDGs because if we don't have strong institutions, we can't have rule of law or we can't have fight against poverty or hunger or gender equality or any other, but we as NHRIs actually work in all SDGs, all are important, from poverty, hunger, health, education, gender, wash, energy, decent work. And working on all of that, I think, is one of the solutions to tackle the dissatisfaction that, that Goran spoke about and that makes people leave the same demographic deficit is happening in Croatia, particularly after entering the European Union, but when labor market opened for Croatian citizens in, in other EU countries. Um, so 
how do we work with those that are left behind so that no one is actually left behind in the situation where the research that we recently uh, undertook showed that two thirds of population of those that felt that they were discriminated against didn't do anything to protect themselves, did not report it. People are not aware of what their human rights are. They don't know how to protect themselves. And of course, they mistrust the institutions. And I think that mistrust is growing from one year to another. That's particularly visible in, in our work. And in the context of shrinking democratic space that goes with it, and that I, I think feeds that despair and makes people want to leave. Um, one example is in 2016, Croatia had, I'd say, far-right government that spiked discriminatory and hate speech, particularly against ethnic minorities, LGBT, political opponents, um, independent institutions. Um, my report was rejected by the parliament. What we see two or three years later is that the number of recommendations that were implemented by the government in the year that the report was accepted by the parliament was 40%. Unlike the year when it was rejected by the parliament where the implementation rate was 20%. That shows that political commitment and strong democracy, strong democratic institutions are essential to build strong human rights agenda, human rights protection in the country on diversity of human rights issues that will provide for more participatory society where human rights will actually be uh, protected. So um, the national human rights institutions such as mine have this role in, in bridging between, of course, the international standards uh, and national standards, but also national stakeholders, the civil society, the rights holders. We very often have uh, discussions where we have together the parliamentarians, the um, line ministries, civil society, rights holders, uh, different uh, academics, NGOs, and work on different issues from energy poverty to free legal aid to reconciliation issues to police treatment to try to bring the perspectives together and in that way have the human rights debate that would be reflected in the public, that would change the discourse from negative and discriminatory to the positive one. In one attempt to fight the despair that actually makes people want to leave. Thanks, Laura. Maybe now, Vasilika, we can turn to you in, in Albania, in the context of Albania and the work of the, the parliament uh, an engagement and inclusion of the parliament in participatory decision making. Where do we stand on sustaining peace and implementing or using the SDGs, particularly SDG yeah. 16, as a vehicle for strengthening the social contract? Thank you, Shelley. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to attend this forum, but also to be part of the discussion today. I agree what uh, Goran said about the trust to the politicians. It's true in our region, the public trust uh, is very low and we have to do a lot of to improve the perception and the trust. Before I entered to the politics, I, uh, I used to be human rights activist for more than 20 years and I, uh, I am part of the academic area. And I would like to share some uh, my feeling now as part of the pol uh, politician as uh, MP. Of course, uh, it's uh, very important the cooperation between the parliament, civil society, academics, experts, and uh, independent institutions such as Ombudsman, Commissioner for Non-Discrimination, etc. But uh, I would like to say some word, uh, words about the role of civil society in the parliament because our, the role of civil society is crucial in the nowadays because uh, they can act as mediator and they can prevent many conflicts. They can be between the parliament, the state and the group of interest, but also the civil society can uh, contribute and in Albania is a very 
important role of the civil society, including also media, uh, for strengthening an uh, inclusive society. Of course, we came from different country, country in the region. We had conflict among each other. Sometimes it's so difficult to communicate uh, in, at the government level, but uh, civil society can bridge, uh, can uh, 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 help or can build bridge between uh, our countries. I'd like also to mention the role of uh, women uh, uh, NGOs. Uh, Albania is a very good model. We are 40 uh, women MP. We have been some years ago, three, four, and thanks to the role of the NGOs, particularly the civ women civil uh, NGOs, the number of women in the parliament uh, was increased. It's not just case number issue, but it's the problem how we uh, handle the uh, problems that society is facing. So I think if we come back to the SDGs and particularly the goal 16, the role of civil society is very important. You know that uh, uh, Albanian government adopted the 2030 agenda and the parliament uh, adopted a resolution. And uh, I would like to say that Albania was the pilot country for the goal 16. And uh, the parliament took the responsibility to, or, to uh, have the judiciary reform in uh, place. And, uh, you know, we have very deep judiciary reform. And the re first results are uh, already uh, very visible. But it was not easy without support of civil society, uh, university professor, practitioner. And the key element of the judicial reform uh, success was uh, the process. It was a real long process with uh, uh, more than 1,400 uh, uh, experts. It was transparent process, inclusive, participatory. So it was really very good. And what Goran said that public don't, do not trust the politician, this is true, and this is the reason that the judiciary reform in my country was done by na national and international experts, not by the government, not by us as politicians. But also I'd like to say, to mention something about the role of independent institution. Uh, they report to the parliament, they, they pr provide recommendation, and uh, it's very important to listen to them and to follow up uh, the implementation of their recommendation. In my country, we set up a uh, mechanism, we establish a mechanism to follow up the implementation of the recommendation done by independent institution. And this is very important because we have face-to-face -face the government, uh, uh, independent institution and civil society actors are present when we have hearings or when we uh, uh, discuss about the report of Ombudsman or uh, Commissioner for Non-Discrimination and so on. Also, I'd like to say some words about the need to cooperate between the government, civil society and parliament. The inter-ministerial committee or inter-institutional working group which was established is very important about the SDGs. But what I found it uh, difficult in my country is uh, the coordination. It's so difficult to follow as member of the parliament all the uh, goals and the indicators because it's a kind of lack of data. We need to uh, have uh, updated uh, uh, information about the NGO who are work working in uh, every day. We have to know what they are doing, who is going to work for the goal one, two, three, four, and so on. And as member of parliament, poli as policy maker, we need to have this fresh information, updated uh, information, but also uh, I would like to say that the, uh, the civil society can be uh, very important for uh, legislative function, oversight role of the parliament, but also for uh, oversight of the budget and also as repre uh, representative of the citizens we can uh, learn more and we can improve our uh, skills and uh, behavior. Uh, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Vasilika. So, Pear.
One of the actors that has not played such a significant role, I would say, and maybe you all can correct me, in sustaining peace uh, in the Western Balkans so far has been the private sector. It hasn't been an actor that has been seen and that we often discuss, you can hear from the panelists, in terms of the role that the private sector should play in sustaining peace and supporting implementation of the SDGs, particularly SDG 16. What is your view on how the private sector can contribute to a positive peace? I would need to focus on business in more general than the Balkans because I don't know that too well. But there's an old saying that if you want peace, let people trade. It's been around for a few hundred years. Still, and some would ask, add that maybe the greatest contribution of business and economics is the insight that people gain more from trading with each other than trying to conquer each other. So in a way you could say that when we say peace, we mean business. Now, not all profits are created equal. There are some profits that have a social purpose or a higher purpose that creates a virtuous cycle between community and company progress and prosperity. It's a higher level of capitalism. And that kind of thinking, which is behind trying to merge a higher purpose with profits, is, in my mind, the future of business. When the world becomes more polarized, technology comes along creating these uh, both opportunities and problems. If business doesn't broaden its mindset to see that value creation is different from value capturing, then you won't really sustain very long in business. Now, bringing it back to uh, Goran's point about despairing and wanting to leave the country, I think a key aspect that business can contribute besides thinking more broadly is to help what is included, I think, in sustaining peace concept and the positive peace concept. That peace is really the optimal environment for the human potential to flourish. Which basically means that you need human rights respected, you need democratic institutions respected, you need the trust, but you need to believe in the future. You talked yesterday about dreams. You need to think that the future are bigger than today. Because if it's not, you will be afraid of the future. And what business can do is really to help solve problems. Because if you don't solve problems, you don't create value. So if you make money without solving problems for other people, you're stealing. So if those problems you solve are bigger than just the ordinary economic that makes you money, it's solving problems in society, it's helping improving society, then you will see that money can motivate, but no amount can inspire. You need a bigger goal, a bigger ideal, a bigger idea to inspire. So if business can be around and help improving society, then you can bring that dream and that inspiration back and let people stay in the country and, and see the opportunities there lie in there. So this way of thinking in the foundation we call to be business worthy. All business people globally know the concept of being credit worthy. Credit worthy is about not losing other people's money. Business worthy is about earning other people's trust. Trust is really what is lacking. You don't trust the institution. People that don't trust business don't buy their products. It's this skin in the game, this interdependence, that unless I give something to you that's valuable, you won't buy from me. The magic of business is really that when you find a good business model, 
to a, sol to a problem, it can scale and business can pay for itself. So I think I end by that. Great, thanks. Okay. So maybe Goran, I give the floor back to you. We've uh, had quite a challenging picture of the state of the Western Balkans and sustaining peace, and you first laid out those challenges. As Laura said, so where do we go from here? Clearly 20, 25 years in this game. What is it that we can do differently? How can we use more effectively uh, the SDG agenda, the HOPE agenda, the partnership agenda, private sector and others who have not been engaged as meaningfully in um, sustaining peace in the Western Balkans. What can we do going forward? Well, I'll go back to what Laura has said. Actually, I do always in my life see a uh, glass half full. And what I was saying was not an idea that I wanted really to create a very depressive picture. But I did want to wake you up a bit to say, guys, there are these things happening. Uh, as I'm actually optimistic, I think there was uh, a number of initiative, projects, activities implemented with different actors. And I will immediately jump into what the business is doing currently, per on what you've said. We actually have a great thing happening during the last two years in the Balkans. It's called Chamber Investment Forum. Well, the politicians have learned to look around, ask their chief economists, where do we earn money? Obviously, Serbian leadership has got the feedback in Bosnia and Herzegovina, in Albania, in Kosovo, where we call it export, not just erase the label, but this is where we are making the money. And then you've had a uh, chief, uh, head of the Serbian Chamber of Commerce, hand in hand with the Kosovo Chamber of Commerce, going around to the guys saying, guys, let's discuss a free trade and that's what we care for. And there was a full backing of politicians. So one of the great things happening now in the context of the Berlin process, so-called, is that we have an office now open as regional office, which is doing several things, promoting the region as single investment destination, and is working now on the list of non-tariff barriers, as we do have CEFTA uh, free trade arrangement. Now we've convinced the leaders to agree on going for a free trade in services, not only commodities only, making a list of non-tariff barriers, and this is why we, the business society is helping, to say these are our real life problems, call it politically whatever you want, just remove this from the roads. And now this is one great thing happening, because now they really have put political issues aside and are focusing on what is this. We in the Regional Cooperation Council are supporting this process by trying to <coughs> remove barriers for the professionals. So we are doing the standardization of professional qualifications among ourselves and with the EU so that we can provide for the people within so-called regional economic area, which brings the six economies together, to freely move and work. Then we are now negotiating automatic recognition of diplomas, which should again add to the free movement within the region of professionals. Then we've learned from the EU this uh, on the roaming. We would like to replicate the free roaming area. And we are now negotiating. We're going to present now. I'm going to Sofia for this EU Western Balkan Summit to present where we are when it comes to the free roaming area among the six. And then Commissioner Gabriel is coming from the European Commission to present the roadmap, how we're going to get the free roaming with the EU eventually. So it's going to be a roadmap on so-called international roaming. So there are great things happening. But we, I, I started with this gray picture to say understanding of what is the peace has to go further than stop shooting at each other. And there, I would like to invite each and everyone to be my allies in this to explain we need to deal with the political issues, but we need to really create an atmosphere which will be attractive for the people to stay. And I wanted to point out it's not only about the money. Although when you ask the people, what is your problem? There is no difference between Albanians and Serbs or anybody else in the region. Employment. So it's all about employment and then overall difficult economic situation, and then the third is corruption. They are saying that this is an issue. So I just wanted to say that the business is helping a lot. They're doing a job. 
And we are creating a regional economic area for them. Politicians have understood this lesson. But now we need to go further in order particularly to go back to what Laura is doing and what Vasilika is doing, both of them, to strengthen a national human rights institution. This is a legacy of the UN. Now it is the EU who is spinning this in the region, putting a pressure, but it's actually the UN legacy. And we need more to do to strengthen them. They are under huge pressure in Croatia, in Serbia, elsewhere. They are doing a great job because we somehow were lucky to have personalities. And people see them and they trust them, but still eventually, when it comes to the responsiveness of the government, it's not the zero level, as Laura has explained, but it's not really good. They cannot even present the report to the parliament, and that's a bad thing, bad news. And then judiciary. It's hell of a job. What they've done in Albania, it was politically challenging. It goes with the national pride. I, as a Serb, really feel for Albanians that they had to do such a dramatic change to accept the foreigners to be part of the vetting procedure. I understand, it's not easy. And I did understand a political fight in Albania on this issue. Respecting, it would be difficult for me, I admit. But on the other hand, obviously what Vasilika was telling us, it was that bad. It was that bad when it comes to the corruption and trust in judiciary that they had to go that far. And I really would like to say they need to be awarded for what they are doing. So at least they should start negotiating with Albania. The same goes for the government uh, in Skopje. Guys, they are discussing a most sensitive political issue, the name issue, identity issue. If they can have a breakthrough, they have to be part of these leaders in the accession process now. So there is a lot to be done which will regain the trust in politicians, but it cannot happen as long as we do not have a trust in the institutions. Therefore, let's go back to SDGs, and I'm linking this from the EU perspective because we are very much in the accession, and the language is the one that we use. So chapter 23, reform of judiciary. Chapter 24, reform the institutions which are implementing the laws, police reform. Go for this if we don't have a real viable success there. We will have jasna and jasnas, rather than a flourishing society, because I can also tell you great stories. Who invented fake news, good or bad? Guys around Skopje, who were part of the election process in the US, guys, they've done it. As the digital is very close to their minds, they can do it. And they earn the money, so we may like it or dislike it, but they prove Something I know, the second fastest growing business in Bosnia is digital, IT. Yeah. And this keeps the people home yeah. because they can do it wherever they are. So there are very good messages coming from the region as well. I didn't want to make this as bad day for the Balkans, but I wanted to have very honestly. Whatever we have done, as long as Jasna and Jasnas are not convinced that there is a future for their children, We've not done nothing good. And we cannot talk about a peace in the Balkans after the wars. Thank you. Thank you, Goran. Laura, I'm, I'm sure you're dying to build on that and expand on that, particularly on civic space, maybe, and what we need to do. Over to you. My first takeaway point from today is actually inviting Per to come to Croatia and probably other Western Balkan countries to speak about importance of giving back to the community on behalf of the private sector. What we have nowadays is corporate social responsibility based mostly on the philanthropy uh, with some business and human rights initiatives, very important though on the diversity in the labor market, but not so much on giving back to the community, which is very important to empower those right holders to seek to know their rights and to seek protection from, from the institutions. But Goran, again, touched upon so many important issues when it comes to partnerships. Yes, of course, civil society, digital age, connecting with the youth to, to work with them, to educate, to discuss issues, to, to find that future that we then see in, in our own countries and, and build the country and its democratic institutions. Um, UNDP, in, when speaking about national human rights institutions and what we do to build strong 
institutions is that we hold governments, but also civil society very often, also private sector very often, accountable for what they do in country when it comes to human rights. In order to do that, we need to be independent. We need to have capacity, we need to have knowledge, we need to have expertise. And very often, not only that we are under, under attack politically, personally, we don't have the resources. And that's where international community, and particularly UNDP, is really important and helpful, and has proven to be so in many countries, including my own Croatia. Uh, we, my office has been strengthened really with the, with the support of UNDB, but also as the part of the EU accession process prior to becoming EU member state because we were an indicator or the benchmark in the chapter 23. You know what happened a year later or two years later or three years later? It just deteriorated, it collapsed. Because the country, if it's not ready, if it's not intrinsic, to well, it means the EU membership does not cure all diseases. It does not cure. It just, you do whatever it, well, the country does whatever it takes to become a member state. Once it becomes, it just goes back to, if not what it was before, then even worse to what it was before. So at the same time, continuing support from the international community is something that really works because I'd say that at least for Croatia, I think it's so for, for the other Western Balkan countries as well, is the international pressure always comes very handy to keep up with the standards that are accepted um, in previous processes. Um, when it comes to European Union, it also supports, it supports uh, European network of national human rights institutions through many projects. There's also a tripartite partnership between OHCHR, UNDP, and, and Gandhi, the global network of um, national human rights institutions. Uh, European Union um, has support to NHRIs very strongly when it comes to the external action service and the countries outside of the EU. Of course, it has challenges when it comes to external internal coherence that we of course, discuss and work together on. But I think within those partnerships, and of course, always with civil society, media, and people themselves, those that recognize that something's wrong, that their human rights is violated, that they are discriminated against, and more to particularly those that still don't recognize it, is crucial. It's crucial, including through the civic education that lacks I think in, in many of our educational systems. Thanks, Laura Pear. Yeah. I just wanted to to add a comment on what you said about inviting me. Uh, I'm I'm happy to come. But uh, you mentioned about uh, telling people, uh, business people uh, in your country, that they should give back to society, which I think they should. But also that it's it's about social responsibility. It's more than that. And I think that is the key point here. Because this is really uh, about that there need not be a trade-off between social progress and profitability. Because that trade-off is really the cradle of innovation. That's where you innovate to differentiate your business. And I think that the SDGs, since that is sort of an overriding uh, umbrella here, is so important because it's a roadmap that bridges that societal level with the business level. As long as you understand the strategic aspects of it. I think that last panel was about climate change. Three years ago, I was part in, in, in Paris about, uh, during the, uh, the agreement on the climate change. And what happened there, I think, is significant for the SDG as well. It was really that Climate change went from being a sacrifice to being a business opportunity. Because you started to optimize your business to more than just profits, but seeing that there are opportunities in solving the biggest problem we have. I think this will go from another, a lot of other issues we have in the SDGs. So that's why I think it's so important that you, we use the SDGs to bridge those elements 
that creates the world we all want, the, the positive peace points, with the actions of business. Up to 90% of all jobs are in business. That's the action people. We need to get them along. But to start with that, business people need to be business worthy. That's really the thinking and the action business people have to have in order for SDGs to happen. Thanks, Per. Yeah, Facilica, yeah. maybe you can yes. I think have the, some final thoughts. The only person who is in very bad position, I am, because I, I came from the politics. And, uh, but I would like to say that not all politicians are the bad and black cats. Uh, I, I know that uh, we have to improve ourselves and we have to increase the tr public trust. And to do this, we have to be more transparent. And all the functions that we have in uh, Parliament should be more uh, participatory, inclusive. And I would like to say that thanks to the transparency that we raised last year, uh, the trust of public trust to the Parlam Albanian Parliament uh, was increased 12% comparing to the year 2016. But this is not enough because the judiciary reform is another issue. But there are many other uh, reforms that we should undertake in our region. The fight against organized crime, money laundering. We have to cooperate better among each other to improve the climate for business also. But I would like to say that we cannot go always and say that uh, the, all the problems came from the politicians. In this way, we can create a big gap between the citizens and the politicians. And we cannot in, uh, encourage the young people to be active in the politics, in the decision-making process, and so on. But also I'd like to say that uh, the achievement of SDGs uh, require, requires uh, a good cooperation among all the actors. Uh, parliament, we have not to forget the role of the parliament. Also uh, freelance experts, academics, practitioner, business, media. And media is very, very important. And Coming to all this goal, I would like to put the emphasis in the goal 5 and 16. And I'd like to say that the role of the UN agencies in, and uh, UNDP and UN Women in particular is very important to support the uh, MPs to strengthen their role, oversee role, but also to uh, raise the trust, public trust. Otherwise, we cannot have very good result and the achievement will take more and more time. Thank you. Thanks so much. So fantastic. Thank you all. I thought that was a great review. And when Goran said the EU does not solve all problems, of course, the SDGs are a global agenda. What is so new and innovative about the development agenda today is it applies to all countries, developing and developed alike and to EU countries. And while the EU accession process really propels countries forward on many of these SDGs, particularly SDG 16, um, the overall SDG vision is as relevant for EU member countries as it is for the Western Balkans and others. So with that, I'm gonna open. I see a lot of appetite in this uh, room for questions, for uh, exciting comments and statements. And so I'm going to give it over to our colleague in the front. Please, uh, you have the floor. Thank you very much for the opportunity to just briefly comment, make some comments. Uh, um, having in mind that uh, governmental mandates are much shorter than our Agenda 2030 horizon is, so its of core value is how we will transfer our cultural governance to the future generations. But because someone of uh, you mentioned uh, what kind of uh, future we leave our, our future generations, um, I'm sure that some new kids on the block are making some new blockchains which will decentralize our, our democracy model. So it's highly important to think about the, something what uh, American movie maker, actually movie director William Gilbert said. 
he said that the future is already here, but is un unevenly distributed. So we need to take care about the way of distribution of the future, all among us. And then, thank you very much to Mr. Saxegard, simply because he mentioned both sides of the coin of the IT. Uh, IT really creates opportunities for all the people, but there are some problems with IT sector. Uh, think about Jamos paradox. We we build a huge machines with whom we we destroy all the all the natural resources around us. And think about um, the digital divide is a big problem also created by the the, the, the the digitalization of our societies. So IT developers will integrate into their algorithms ethical models we promote today and support today. So we need to pay attention to that. Thank you so much. Thank you. We can take a few more comments and questions and then I'll give it to the panel. Please, over here, we have a group of three questions. Hello, everyone. Elif uh, from Turkey, Conflictus. Uh, what I hear from you is like uh, more uh, the issues about structural uh, things that we need to do actually like at the very country level but also local level but very like structural perspective so I wonder in order to really uh, have a positive peace that like not just uh, lack of violence but absence of violence but also the uh, enjoyment of the rights and like the uh, respect to human dignity should be there so how do you think we can um, change our attitudes and behavior at the very like personal level regarding the like countries that we are living in and what what, what do you perceive about these kind of uh, things actually thank you UNDP um, thank you to the panel thank you also to Laura and Vasilika for bringing the issue of EU integration and what happens or might happen after EU integration. And I pick on the point of slipping back into old habits. Um, the UN right now is going through UN reform. What message or advice would you give to the UN and other multilaterals in terms of their role in Eastern Europe, um, the Balkans, in all of Europe, in terms of the accession process, but also after accession, issues of disparities in countries, between countries, climate change. We all know it's going to take longer and more money than um, we, we previously estimated to tackle, um, issues of dealing with the past, so, so many issues that require much, much longer interventions and partnerships and this whole IDD 2018 is about partnerships, but sustaining those partnerships to actually re um, reach and attain results. So I'm, I'm really, um, I would really like to hear from you as um, representatives of these countries and working in these countries, what would you see as the role of multilaterals, the UN and UNDP um, going forward? Thank you. We have two more, one here and then one in the back, three more, and then one in the middle. Uh, good afternoon, my name is Bastien. I work as a consultant for UNDP. I've worked quite a lot in the Balkans before. Uh, I had a question about an institution that maybe wasn't uh, mentioned so much in your, in your intervention, which is the role of, uh, of local authorities. Uh, decentralization was quite an important part of, I think, many peace agreements in the, in the Balkans uh, as a way to also bring institutions closer to the citizens and bridge a bit this trust gap that, that you mentioned. So you've made a strong case for the role of the private sector, of uh, independent institutions, parliament, civil society in, uh, in sustaining peace, uh, in implementing SDG 16. Do you also see a role uh, for, for local authorities moving forward uh, in the Balkans? And if yes, which one is it? Thank you. Thank you. Then we have the young lady here and another young lady in the middle, and then we'll give it over to the panel. Thank you. Okay, I am Elif Göçek. I'm from Istanbul, Turkey. I'm a clinical psychologist. So I'm listening everything through a psychological perspective and trying to understand how can we go to a peaceful world. And let me share what I think. First of all, trauma 
not a trauma. It's a trauma that everybody, all babies are living in this world, are transferred and carried through the genes. I don't know if you know that. It's implanted into the genes and it carries out from generation to generation. This means if you don't have one baby, and if the baby is traumatized, it will carry this stressful brain, the neurology through generations. So what does this mean is we have to stop the war and we should have a peaceful world. But what's happening is our leaders, our leaders of the countries are very, very much, I believe, not peaceful internally. Otherwise, they wouldn't go to wars. They wouldn't let people fight with each other and try to solve the problems through a peaceful and through a secure attachment. If you know what secure attachment means, this means you try to solve problems peacefully, not through fighting. So what I'm trying to invite, please let's choose our leaders who's going to govern the countries through much careful way, not through, probably we have to screen them with mentally and healthily, psychologically, uh, whether they are secure, they are, whether they are happy and ready to share the world with everybody. Thank you. Thank you so much. So we'll take the last question and then the panel will have to uh, summarize quickly and rush. We have uh, airplanes waiting for many panelists. Please. Hello, Thank it's Ria you. from Turkey. So the question that comes to my mind is actually uh, after Goran's story. So I just like realizing that all the problems that we are stressing right now, either institutional level or at systematic level. So I wonder, like, what kind of role and responsibilities that you think citizens of a country can take for government's accountability and credibility? Thank you. Thanks. So we have, a, I'll let the panelists touch on just the questions that you think are important. We have a question around digitalization and digital divide and the impact positive and negative of technology and IT, the role of local governments, uh, the issue of citizen engagement, citizen responsibility, changing behaviors and attitudes beyond structural and institutional change, and also thoughts on UN reform. I realize that uh, this panel needs to end rapidly, so I'll let you all panelists say one quick thing in response to those strong questions and we'll conclude. Who would like to go first? Goran, can I ask you? Thanks. Yeah. Uh, I will address some of the questions, not all. I would like to start with the last one. You may not like the answer. You ask about the responsibility of the citizens for the future uh, of the country. Well, I've spent more than five years in Sarajevo because the, the Regional Cooperation Council is in Sarajevo. And there have been two moments during these five plus years when the citizens were provoked. One was 2013. There was no political agreement in the country on the newly born babies' IDs, uh, 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 personal number. And some died because the administration, there was no political agreement, therefore the baby who was born couldn't have a personal number, therefore could not have a personal document, therefore could not go to Serbia or Croatia to be cured, baby died. 400 people gathered that night on that issue. And that's it. For me, this was a huge lesson. I thought, uh, understanding complexity of the country, ethnic, political, national, that at least this is something which will bring the best out of the people. But they are so frustrated. They somehow are lacking energy. They believe, they trust nothing. There was another moment, three years later, when there was a protest but it was also a limited one. So coming back to this, please understand, we voted these people. 
nobody else. I spent six years as an MP, four years uh, as a minister. And let me tell you something. Now, speaking on behalf of politicians, we were five in the room deciding on the extradition of Milosevic. People would never support the decision we brought. Not even today. Being in politics also means that sometimes you do the things you really feel here that you have to do. And things that have nothing to do with your political future, personally, but you have to do. So it's a tricky thing between the popular support, therefore what I want to tell you, perhaps we can say about Yasin that she's spoiled. She's arrogant. We are arrogant believing that we are better than the politicians, as we have voted them in. Been there, done that, was in a situation to clearly speak my mind, being aware that it means end of politics, but it's good for my country, I believe it was. So it's a tricky thing, this relation between the people and the politician. It's a very complex thing. Uh, something else? Gorn. Uh, okay. our, our colleagues need to yep. get to the yeah, airport. Yeah. Okay, I'll stop, no problem. So they may leave, I'll continue. They, <laughs> yeah, they will leave, so apologies, and Gorham will continue, but thank you so much, Laura. Thank you, Pear. Vasilika, thank you so much. And Goran, you can sum up maybe, uh, or would you like us all to conclude? Okay, if I can just briefly answer, if I need to pick one, it, it would be the one on slipping into the old habits. I don't know much or at all about UN reform, but I'd say if I could give you a suggestion on how to support national stakeholders in their context into not slipping back, it would be use the SDGs. It, it's a recipe. It gives you the whole variety from gender equality to life below water. Everything is relevant for human rights and building strong institutions and supporting national human rights institutions and civil society and governments into more democratic and peaceful societies. Pear, do you want to say something quickly? Uh, this will be very quickly. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> the vision of this foundation is that all business leaders should have as their purpose to improve society. So why don't you all go back and talk to your business uh, relatives or relationship and ask them, if you're not here to improve society, then why are you here? Thank you. Thank you. We'll end it there. Thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, it is time for the coffee break, but this is a very different coffee break. Please can I ask you to bring your coffee inside because we are, we've run, uh, we're running out of time. So do bring your coffee inside. We'll have a very short one. Should we say roughly about 10 minutes, but bring it inside, finish it here, and we will continue swiftly with the next panel, which is a very, very interesting panel. And, um, for those of you who do have to leave, but I urge you, please do not leave because the next panel is absolutely fantastic. If you are going to leave, leave your badges in the designated boxes outside because that's a lot of plastic um, that needs to be used again for next year's event. So see you shortly and bring your coffee inside as soon as possible. Thank you.